consider the bacterium E. coli. You must have heard of it, right? Bacteria like E. coli have a single circular chromosome and it is within this chromosome that all the genes required for E. coli to survive and reproduce are packed. For example, this is going to have genes involved in digesting food, genes needed to replicate DNA like the gene that codes for DNA polymerase and genes needed for cell wall synthesis, genes for cell division. It could also have genes that don't code for any protein or there might be proteins that we have not discovered yet. Whatever it is, they are all packed within this single chromosome. Now think about something. Do you think it is needed by E. coli to synthesize enzymes and proteins involved in digesting food when there is no food source? Or for this organism to synthesize DNA polymerase when it is not replicating its DNA? The answer to the question lies in the fact that protein synthesis, the whole transcription and translation process, requires a lot of energy. And these organisms, being as small as they are, have to work very hard to conserve energy. Because whatever little energy they are producing, it has to go towards its survival and replication and it should not be wasted. And one way by which energy can be wasted is if the organism is synthesizing proteins that are not needed at that moment. For example, when there is no food source, there is no point in secreting the enzyme needed to digest food, right? It would just be a waste of energy. So the way by which E. coli tries to conserve energy is by regulating the expression of its different genes. It makes sure that the genes are expressed only when it is required and they are not expressed when they are not required, when the proteins are not required. And one way by which the bacterium accomplishes it is with the help of different operons. Now what is an operon? An operon is a sequence of DNA it contains a promoter which is part of a regulatory sequence and the promoter is involved in transcribing specific genes and these genes make up the structural genes of the operon. For example, in this sequence of DNA, you have a promoter here P that controls the expression of genes A, B and C. These are the structural genes. If you remember from previous videos, the promoter is where RNA polymerase comes and binds and initiates the transcription, right? And when it is initiated, the transcription is initiated, all these three genes are synthesized at the same time and somehow the proteins that are produced are involved in the same function. For example, if we are talking about digesting food, then these proteins are involved in digesting food. Other parts of the regulatory sequence include the operator region. Now the operator region acts like the mother switch to the promoter itself. So the operator region can switch on or off the promoter. The functioning of the promoter depends on the operator. There is another part of the regulatory sequence known as the repressor. We'll talk about that in just a while when we're talking about the lac operon. So these are the different parts of an operon, a promoter, the structural genes and other parts of the regulatory sequence. Now what is the LAC operon? The LAC operon is the set of DNA sequences involved in the digestion of lactose, the breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose. Lactose as we know is a disaccharide, right? It is made up of glucose and galactose. Now you see, E. coli is a very stubborn organism. It always prefers glucose as its energy source and not anything else, even lactose or galactose. So when glucose is present, E. coli can directly use glucose as a source of energy, break it down either aerobically or anaerobically and synthesize energy. But when glucose is not present, when lactose is only present, still is very stubborn and says I will not use lactose directly. I will convert it into glucose and galactose and then use glucose to produce energy. And the process of converting lactose into glucose and galactose is regulated by the LAC operon. And what are the parts of a LAC operon? As I said, there is a promoter region that regulates the expression of a repressor region. Here is where the repressor comes into the picture. The repressor region, ironically called I, 
codes for the repressor protein. Now, what does this repressor protein do? I'll get to that in just a while. You have the other promoter which regulates the expression of these structural genes. Now, what are the three structural genes in the LAC operon? You have the LAC Z, LAC Y and LAC A genes. LAC Z codes for beta galactosidase. This is the main enzyme needed to break down lactose into glucose and galactose. That's what this beta galactosidase does. LAC Y codes for permease which increases the permeability of the cell to lactose. So when the food source present is only lactose and the bacterium says fine I will use up as much lactose as possible when it is present. Permease is going to increase the permeability of the cell to lactose. Transacetylase is encoded by the LAC A gene. Scientists are not entirely sure what the function of transacetylase is but it is still somehow involved in the breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose. Now there is another region known as the operator region. Like I said this is like the mother switch for the promoter. So this is where the repressor protein comes into the picture. What does it do? When lactose is not present then the repressor protein is synthesized. And what does this repressor protein do? It goes and binds to the operator region of the LAC operon. Now when the repressor protein is bound to the operator region, then RNA polymerase can no longer initiate transcription of these three genes. So no protein is synthesized when lactose is absent. It makes sense right because when there is no lactose present then these three genes need not be expressed. Again this is a mechanism to conserve energy. So when lactose is not present the repressor protein binds to the operator region and it prevents the RNA polymerase from accessing the promoter thereby preventing the expression of lac Z, Y and A. So no beta galactosidase or permease or transacetylase is produced in the absence of lactose. Now what if lactose is present? Let us consider that scenario where lactose is present. So here we have lactose. When lactose is present the lactose itself is going to act as an inducer and come and bind to the repressor protein. And when the lactose is bound to the repressor protein, it can no longer bind to the operator. It's going to come and try of course, it's going to come and try but it can no longer bind to the operator region. So when the operator region is not bound by this repressor protein, RNA polymerase is free to go and bind to the promoter region. RNA polymerase comes and binds to the promoter and when RNA polymerase is bound to the promoter, it's gonna allow the transcription of the three structural genes. So with RNA polymerase being bound to the promoter region, the LAC, Z, Y and A genes are going to be transcribed as a polycystronic mRNA which means it's a single mRNA. And the mRNA is going to undergo translation and the enzymes beta galactosidase, permease and transacetylase are going to be produced. And when the enzymes are produced, beta galactosidase is going to cleave lactose into glucose and galactose. So this way E. coli regulates the expression of these three genes in two scenarios when lactose is present and when lactose is not present in the absence of lactose and it is a mechanism to conserve energy.